Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Those are great words, singing hallelujah, you are my God. What, what better words can we speak? What more confidence can we have that, that he is our God? Father, thank you that we can come today and be in your house, Lord God, that you are not a God of, of our calendar, Lord God. You are here. It doesn't matter if there's, there's a three-day week. It doesn't matter. You're here, and we're here, and we're here to worship you, Lord. And that's all that matters. Yes. Lord God, we glorify you and we, we turn our eyes upon you, Lord. Lord God, we need you more now than ever in, in our world, in our country, in our city, in our lives, in our personal lives. We need you now more than ever. And Lord yes. God, you are, you are able and you're also willing to come in and to to rearrange things, to pull us from one spot to another, and, and Lord God, to challenge us and to convict us. And Lord God, we welcome that within each one of our lives. Lord, it's not easy to live in this sinful world, but you know that. And you have provided every single thing that we need. So today, Jesus, we lift your holy name on high. Yes. Lord God, you are the rock of our foundation. Lord God, you are everything to us. Lord God, help us to keep our eyes upon you and to, to pull our eyes from the worldly things that so so desperately try to distract us. Yes. Jesus, we love you. We don't love you just this morning. We love you always. And we glorify you, not just this morning. We glorify you always. And we worship you, not just this morning. We worship you always help us to live a lifestyle of Jesus. Thank you. The world needs to see that, and we need to express that. So today, Jesus, we praise you. Yes. We praise your holy name. Yes. We boldly proclaim your holy name, and we pray in your mighty name. Yes. And everyone shout it out. Amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. How is everybody doing this morning? Not that well, apparently. How is everyone doing this morning? Wonderful! I love it! I'll make a confession to you right now as a pastor. Sometimes even as a pastor, I know this is going to be surprising to you, sometimes our eyes shift and roam just a little bit, right? We're not as perfect and holy as some of you might think. Amy's back there chuckling, going, oh, you have no idea. But sometimes on a three-day weekend like this, and I, I watch how many people are coming in and how many people are gone, and I confess sometimes I can be like, oh my gosh, where is everybody? But then God so graciously reminds me of things that I can tend to forget. See, I've preached in all different places, in all different atmospheres. I've preached in churches, obviously. I've preached in auditoriums. I've, I've preached multiple services. I've, I've preached on reservations. I've preached in Africa in a tree hut with bare floors. I have preached to many during COVID, I, I basically preached to an empty church. And, and here is what God reminds me of. God doesn't base His presence upon our attendance numbers. So it doesn't matter how many people show up, God's going to show up, right? The Scriptures say where two or three are gathered. Well, there's always two or three gathered. There is all, And God always shows up. So on days like this, when our numbers are just a little bit down, what I sometimes tend to find is that there's more of an intimacy. You don't have to pull, pull those lights down a little. That's super bright, Carl. Take those down about halfway. Um, there's an intimacy here. And, and I don't know why, but, but people can tend to open up their hearts just a little more sometimes when there's less people here. I don't understand it. I say all that to say that God has a message for you today. He has something to speak to you today, just like every Sunday. But let's all resolve right now that we're going to really open up to him this morning and allow him in and 
follow where he leads us. Can we do that this morning? All of us? Hands? No hands. There's a few hands. Thank you for being so inter interactive without really being prompted. Maybe a little bit. That's it. We got to get we got to get lively today. It helps me out a lot. Okay. With that being said, let's let's dismiss the children, kids. Headed down with Amy again um, this week. Hopefully, it will be awesome. I think it will. For us up here, we got a couple quick announcements. We'll run through them relatively quick. We have Wednesday nights are starting this coming Wednesday. Yes. So we got 6.30 is when they start. We have stuff for adults, kids, and youth. Um, you heard about kind of what's happening in youth. Let's, let's find out what's happening for the adults. Flip that slide. I'm going to be leading a class. It's a 12-week it's a class, and it's the Family Project, the Divine Reflection, Solid Steps to Building a Strong Family. It's about recover, renew, and reclaim. And, and really, the, the, the whole gist of this is, is this idea that the family is important. How many of you guys believe the family is important? How many of you guys believe that the family is an invention by God himself. God invented the family. Society, mankind, sinful nature tries to destroy that family. So this is actually going to be a really great series. Um, I've watched part of it. I didn't want to get too far into it, but man, it's it's good so far. So um, we'll go through it. We'll have lots of interactive time, questions, answers, testimonies, and all that. So I would invite you guys, adults, to... Uh, Plan on being here Wednesday night at 6.30. We will meet over at the office in the upper level. And it'll probably be a little noisy, and we love that, because on the lower level of the office will be the youth. Flip that slide, and, and we heard last week, um, new name, new launch. It's called Refuge. It's going to be great. So teenagers, sixth grade on up, please plan on attending that. Bring your friends. It's going to be a great time. And then over here in the basement, we have Bridge Kids. So we have our Wednesday night Bridge Kids. So there's something for the whole family. Invite your neighbors. Invite your neighbor kids. If you invite your neighbor kids and their parents don't come, well, then step out of your comfort zone and say, I'll feed them dinner and bring them to church, right? And you can't do it just one Wednesday. You've got to make that commitment so they can be here every Wednesday because I truly believe if you come on a Wednesday night, you're going to be like, hey, I like this. I like it a lot. And then if you miss that Wednesday night, there's going to be that little void and that gap there. And then also starting is women's ministry, right, Georgie? Yes. And that's Tuesdays at 6.30 right here in the church foyer. So they meet in the church foyer, use the big TV out there. There's chairs, tables, and all that set up. So women, um, make sure you put that on your calendar and are ready to attend that. Um, and I, let me just say this. I, I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable, so I apologize if I do. But please keep the shops in your prayers right now. There's a transition in that family, so please just pray for Carol, pray for Jim, pray for the entire family. Um, and we just, we rejoice in this time of that transition because we identify not only with the cross and the death of Jesus, but we also identify with his resurrection. So there's resurrection life and there's resurrection power. And, and, and uh, when we stopped up there yesterday, um, I, I, I found myself, actually I heard myself praying in, in, a, in a way that I've never really prayed before. Have you ever done that? Where you just start praying and you're like, what are you talking about? What? And it, well, that's kind of, and I found myself just praying for Carol and, and, and just, just asking God. I, I, I told God, I said, Carol, her spirit is so ready to step into glory. Her spirit is so longing to step into heaven, but, but her physical body, by our nature, is trying to fight that. And I just asked God that he would release that, that physical and, and take her home in, in his timing and in his will. And when we get to rejoice about that, though we are sad because of the, the separation, we rejoice because of the glory and the promise of the, of the life that, that he gives to us. So please keep that, that family in prayer. And then there's other people. There's, there's people that are sick. There's people that are on vacation. We want people to be safe. There's just all of those things. Dave, 
you talked about praying for our country and stuff, and though that can get hard, God says, just do it. Just do it. And we just need to, to do those things. So good stuff happening, um, but there's a lot of warfare. There's a lot of, there's a lot of opposition that's coming against us personally and as a church and, and as, a, as a believer. So let's stay strong in the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right, giving. Four ways to give. Of course, there's four ways to give. There always is. You can give online, bridgehelena.com. You can use our app. You can text the amount to 84321. You can use our giving boxes. Or you can mail it to 725 Granite Avenue. Again, the form of worship. Dave, again, you were talking about um, the sacrifice of, of worship. And, and part of worship is giving. It really is. That's just, we, we sacrifice a lot when we decide to to faithfully give and faithfully tithe um, and a lot of things in ourselves does have to be sacrificed it has to come to an end and some of that it's it's hard because we want to control certain aspects of our life and a lot of times our finances is high on that list but when we just give in to God great things happen amen all right you guys ready to get rolling here yeah you sure Golly, guys, it's like there's a delay. There's a delay, and it's not in the sound system. It's a, can I get an amen? Pause, pause, pause. No, we're, we're going to be right on it. And here's the deal. Since our numbers are down, you've got to be 30% louder, um, each one of you. Well, the guy in the back's always loud, but it's okay. 30% it would be great. Amen. Let's pray, and let's get rolling on this message. God, what more can we say than we just... We love you, and we just love to be in your presence. And Lord God, we, we don't just say that as lip service to you. We don't just say that because we're, we're on, at church on a Sunday morning. God, I, I truly just want to be with you. And Lord God, you have us in this world for a purpose and a reason. And we want to be faithful and a good steward of what you have given us. But Lord God, ultimately, I just want to be with you. I just want to hang out with you. Place those opportunities in my life, not so that I can leave the bubble that I live in of your gracious and goodness, but that I can bring people into that bubble with me, Lord God. I don't want to. I don't want to leave the garden for the desert unless you come to the desert with me. And I know, Lord God, you equip each one of us to do so. So, God, be glorified today, Father. Your plan is in effect. The church age is happening now, and it's a perfect plan. And we are a part of that, walking through that. So, Lord God, give us the wisdom, the discernment, the boldness, and the energy to do so, Jesus. Wants once again, we love you. Gosh, Jesus, you're, you're our best friend, but you're so much more than that. And we need so much more than that. The storms can get raging. The, the, the mountains can get rocky. The trail can get hard. But Jesus, you are walking with each one of us and help us to put our trust in you, to have confidence in you and to rely upon you. Holy Spirit, allow me to preach those things that you want me to preach, to say those things that you want me to say, to share the scripture that you need me to share today. And let me just leave everything else where it needs to be and that's not here for this morning. And, G and Holy Spirit, I ask once again that nobody leave this place today the same way that they came in. And I truly believe when we pray that prayer and we're open to it, Lord God, you are faithful. None of us leave here the same way that we came in. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, Amen. oh, that's so much better. Love it. We're good. So are you guys ready to continue with our series in Colossians? I was telling a couple people this morning, you know, we had the team challenge ladies last week. And so I didn't preach. You guys got a break from me preaching. But for me, it seems like I haven't been up here in a couple months. It's just, I, I just feels like that. So I'm excited. I'm excited to get back into Colossians because there is just so much packed into this book. Wouldn't you agree? And I hope you're, you're getting it. I hope you're studying it. I hope that, that as we go verse by verse... It's expanding your knowledge of Scripture, but I hope it's also challenging you, and I hope you are being changed 
by this, this amazing, powerful, small book of the Bible that we know as Colossians. Now, if you remember from two weeks ago, from the last time, we talked about walking in Christ, right? It's so vitally important. If you miss that message, you need to grab that message because it's very important that we have this understanding about walking in Christ, but not just an understanding, an actual action that we are walking in Christ. And this means that we are in union with Christ to the point that that he is reflected in our character he's reflected in our words and he is reflected in our actions that's a big challenge isn't it i mean that's a big challenge because we step out of this church and and there's people driving crazy and you get home and your neighbor has done this or the dog's done that or something and and, and it's so easy as to float out of that to step out of that but we need to live in Christ to the point that it's reflected in our character, words, and actions. Yes, it's challenging on a daily basis, but with Jesus and with the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe that we can put forth a pretty darn good effort in this area. And today, we are going to see an important component of this process of walking with Jesus. And then two weeks ago, we also learned we need to be rooted in Jesus. Remember we talked about that? We kind of talked about a tree. And if a tree has no root system, what's it going to do? It's going to fall over. It's going to die. It's not going to be getting any nutrients, right? It's got to have that strong root structure. We also need to have a strong root structure in Christ. Because we are rooted and we seek to to have a deep connection in Jesus, we are able to constantly be renewed in Jesus. How many of you guys know you need to be daily renewed in Jesus? It ain't a one-time thing. If people tell you, hey, you got saved, you prayed the prayer, you're good. You are good. That's all you need to know. You need to be constantly renewed in Jesus because this world takes its tool. How many of you guys know that? How many of you guys know that, that, that through your own experiences that we are steadily eroded and we are broken down simply because we live in a fallen and sinful world? Simply because of that. Now we add on to that poor decisions on our part, and that just compounds. But the fact is, even if we did everything mostly right, because we can't do everything perfectly right, but we we did everything mostly right, we're still going to get eroded simply because we live in this fallen and sinful world. See, our mind, our body, and our spirit is under attack every second of every day. We live in a hostile environment and we see people succumbing to that all around us, all the time. The only defense here, the only hope here, is to be deeply rooted in Christ. Those deep roots cause us to be continually built up and to be established in Him. This too is an active process on our part and today we will also see uh, what we need to do and, and not do to be active in this process. So understand this before we get started today. Please just understand this. Today's text and today's message can be as helpful in your faith as you will allow it to be. Will you be open and will you allow the text that we go through today to, to have an effect on your life? Because here's the deal, you can close it down. You can shut it down, and you can leave here not the same way that you came in, but probably a little worse. Or you can choose to let his text in, let the Holy Spirit in, let this learning process in. As always, let's remember why this letter was so important. Remember, there's the three reasons. Jesus is central and supreme to all, and in all things, Jesus is the Son of God. We are to strive to live in Christ We not only read that and understand that this is why Paul is writing Colossians, we take this and we adapt it and we place it into our own life, right? So we say, flip that, flip that slide. Jesus, you are central and supreme to me and in all things in my life. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. How many of you guys believe it? How many of you guys live it out? Nobody? I do. Jesus, I do. Jesus, I will consistently and continually strive to live a life in you as my Lord 
and Savior. Do you believe it? Seriously, I'm going to keep asking this question because we've got to believe it. If you can't, if you can't sit in church and, and express this belief in church, I'm, I'm telling you what, you're not going to do it outside of this church. So well, let's get into today's message and today's text. Now, if we were to take today's text and, and, and we want to put a separate title on it, today's title of today's message could be this, The Warning, the Deity, the Humanity, and the Completeness. So that's what we're going to be looking at here today. All of which support this idea of the supremacy of Christ, right? The name of this, sim this, uh, this uh, series is The Supremacy of Christ. Today we're going to really look at, at some of those components in here, all of which help us to walk in and be rooted in Christ. And once again, I don't want to seem like I'm beating a dead horse, but please understand we must be active in our faith. I can stand up here and preach till I'm blue in the face. But until you open yourselves up, you're going to keep it out. You're going to block it out. So please understand that, that to be active in your faith, to be here, to show up on Sunday mornings with, with a heart that's open, ready to worship, active in your faith, and ready to receive. There are things that you must do in your faith. And there are things that you must avoid. There are things you must stand up for and things you must stand up against. And there are things you must guard yourselves from. And it's time that the body of Christ, it's, it's time that, that, that the people who attend Bridge Assembly really begin to live a life of faith and action. Are you with me? And that ain't an age thing. You can't, you can't, some of you can't say, well, I'm too young to really live out a, a life of faith. And, and, and some of you can't say, well, I'm too old to really live out a life of faith. God desires us to live out that life of faith until we step into glory and we are with him in his presence for eternity. So can we just all come to that realization and agreement that it's time to really begin to live out our faith and in an active way? Can we, can we do that? You guys, you guys, I hope you're awake today. So let's dig into these four statements that Paul is making to the faithful believers in the Colossian church, um, as well as us right here and right now, right? We, we read with the understanding that this, this, this letter was written so long ago um, within the context of, of the Colossian church and what was going on there, but we know that the word is living and active, so what he wrote then is very applicable for us today, then let's resolve to put some action and intention into our walk. If you have your Bibles today, either paper or electronic or however you choose to bring your Bible to church, uh, turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 8. Verse 8. Verse 8 is the warning, right? We're going to go through all these. So verse 8 we can think of as the warning. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, pseudo-intellectual babble according to the traditions and musings of mere men, following the elementary principles of this world rather than following the truth, the teachings of Christ. There's a lot going on right there. And Paul is saying some, some critical things for us today right here in this verse. See, how he starts this passage is also very important. In your Bibles, underline the words, see to it. It's three words, see to it. Underline that, double underline that, highlight it, circle it, write it on the side. See, Paul is making this personal, and he's placing responsibility upon the reader who is a faithful believer in Christ. See to it means that we must be active and engaged in our own faith. What it doesn't say right here, it doesn't say, hey, don't worry, your spouse or your grandmother or your friend or your pastor, well, they're going to take care of everything. You just sit back and play the role of happy Christian. It doesn't say that. It says, see to it. And it means just what it says. We, each one of us, needs to personally see to it. Now Paul takes us a little bit further and, and what we need to see too. It says that no one take you 
captive. That no one take you captive. See, what he's implying is, is if we see to it, then no one can take us captive because we have power and authority in Christ if we are seeing to it. If we are not seeing to it, there is a, a, a chance, there is an ability that we might be taken captive. So whose responsibility is, is it to see to it? Look in the mirror, point to yourself. It's not your neighbors, it's not the spouse, not the person you're sitting next to. It's not their responsibility. Though we can come alongside our brothers and sisters and help because we're the body of Christ, it boils down to your action, your ability to see to it that no one takes you captive. The Greek word here for captive means to carry one off as a slave. It also means to lead one away from the truth and subject them to one's sway. Right? So sometimes it's not this violent ca captivity. It's this sway. It's this, it's this little tug, right? That's, that's what can be going on. So within this context, to take someone captive is a three-part process. To take captive is to, it's to enslave, it's to lead away from truth, and it's to indoctrinate into a different way of thinking. Does that sound familiar at all? It should because it's going on all around us, from the media, and that, that absolutely includes social media, to our politicians, to our educational system, and it has even influenced our healthcare system. And a lot of times all of these work together because after all, we're, we're, we're gonna start entering into the election flu season. That's gonna, it's gonna start up here pretty quick. See, there's a lot of captivity, but it's captivity coming in this little sway. It's this little, it's this little, hey, I'm gonna lead them away from truth. I'm gonna indoctrinate them to a different way of thinking. And they know that when they continue with that process, it leads to complete slavery. I don't think it's really that hard to see that, that um, we can understand this, right? We can completely see it, we can understand it. Um, there's so many different voices and influences out there that are trying to take us captive. However, we always have to remember the basis for this captivity can be traced back to a desire to divide people from their relationship with God. And a relationship with the Father comes through the Son. So really, right now, the times we're living here, the, the, the goal is to divide us in a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, once we, once we see that, once we acknowledge that, that every, everything, we see that everything boils down to, to good and evil, doesn't it? It's all good and evil. It's one side or the other. There's no gray areas. Remember, we had, we had a whole series on, on no middle ground. We begin to see and acknowledge the importance of walking in Christ and being rooted in Christ. You need to be walking in Christ and rooted in Christ to come to church? Absolutely. Do you need to be walking in Christ and rooted in Christ to go to your workplace? Absolutely. Do you need to be walking in Christ and rooted in Christ to go to the grocery store? Absolutely. It's a one or the other. We need to choose to always be walking in Christ and to be rooted in Him. Let's keep going because because now we're going to see... Uh, really what we are to guard ourselves against. We'll reread this passage. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, pseudo-intellectual babble, according to the tradition and musings of mere men, following the elementary principles of this world rather than following the truth, the teachings of Christ. Now within the context of Paul writing this letter to the faithful believers in the Colossian church, we understand that Paul was warning against the false teachers here. He was literally calling them men-stealers or enslavers. Those are harsh words. Those are big words. But Paul understood 
Paul saw it. Paul saw that this wasn't just an innocent little new philosophy that's making its way into the church and, and really it just adds on to everything because after all, maybe these false teachers, they went to a seminar or they got the newest book at the Christian bookstore and maybe it was just something that got them excited and, and boy, this is more than what my Bible says. This is exciting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to tell people about it and they start propagating that. And, and that's how this seed can sometimes start into churches. But Paul saw that. He saw the danger of that. So he used rather stern words by calling them men stealers or enslavers. So within our context, you know, we just talked about the context of the Colossian church of this book, but within our context and the, and the reality of, of this world, we too need to be on guard against the false teachers that abound both inside and outside of the church. Amen. See, their main weapon is through philosophy and empty deceptions. And Paul goes on to say, this deception comes from the traditions of mere man. Just man, only man, following the elementary principles of this world. You guys know the name of this series, right? It's the supremacy of Christ. But do you remember the definition of supremacy? Because it, it comes in handy here. It's important. Supremacy, the state or condition of being superior to all others in authority, power, or status. Jesus is superior. But Paul is saying to be aware and guard against the empty deceptions and the pseudo-intellectual babble that is based in the inferior, the insufficient, the incomplete sin-stained traditions of and the musings of mere man. We need to guard ourselves against that. It's based in the opposite of the supremacy of Christ. It is based in the elementary, uncomplex, and error-ridden pride of humanity. That's why attending a Bible, believing in a Bible preaching church is so vital to your faith. Amen. Paul gives instructions here to instead follow the truth found in the teachings of Christ, His Word, the Bible which causes each one of us to have to ask ourselves the hard question, the dangerous question, am I filtering everything through the Bible? Are you filtering everything through the Bible? Well, it can't mean everything. He can't really mean filter everything through the Bible. I mean, there are certain things in my life that are really irrelevant. There are certain things in my life that I like to keep separate from my Sunday morning experience, right? Am I really supposed to filter all that through the Bible? Absolutely. There's teachings out there, seemingly good teachings. But are we filtering that through the Bible? Hey, Pastor so-and-so said this. I don't care what Pastor so-and-so said. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Be in your Bible. Be checking your Bible. Filter everything through your Bible. Do you know your Bible has an answer for every decision that you make in life? Did you know that? Do you know the Bible has a, an answer on, on how to be an employee, to be a boss, to be a mother or a father or a son or a daughter? It has all that. It's all in there. We just need to filter it all through the Bible. And we should be doing that. See, not in a subjective way where I put my context into the verse and make it say what I want it to because we're, we're really good at that, aren't we? Ooh, I think I want to do this, so I'm going to find a scripture that lines up with my desires. And you take that subjectively out of context. Actually, you don't just take it out of context. You put your context into it. Isn't that strange? Imperfect man puts their context into the perfect word of God. It's asinine. It's crazy. But we're always, um, we, we're always apt to do that. So we have to guard ourselves against that. See, we need to do it in a literal way where the truth of the Scripture is availed despite our feelings, wants, or desires. It is imperative we understand what Paul is warning us against here. All right, let's, let's keep going. Number two, the deity. Colossians 2, 9, 
A, we say A because it's the first part of the verse. For in him all the fullness of deity, the Godhead, dwells. Comes down to the question, doesn't it? Who is Jesus? That's a big question. That's a popular question right now. We like to bring that topic up. The whole world likes to bring that topic up. Who is Jesus? And here's the deal. Mainstream America and false religions will we'll give a lot here in this question as to who is Jesus. They'll give a lot up to a point. It's a tactic. It's a tactic to try to lead people into captivity, right? It's a tactic to, to try to sway their, their thinking. It, and I call it the tactic of, see, we believe the same thing. You ever hear people say that? You're kind of talking about Jesus and things, and they're going to they're gonna allow you to state some things, and then they're going to come back and say, see, we believe the same things, because, because they're the ones who don't want to debate. They, they're the ones that don't want to argue. See, we believe the same things. We're the same. However, on the points that really matter, there is a noticeable difference. For example, the majority of Americans will admit now that Jesus was a real and historic person. See, we believe the same thing. See, you believe Jesus was a real historic person. I believe Jesus was a real historic person. We believe the same things. They also believe that Jesus was a great teacher, right? Talk to anybody and they'll be like, oh yeah, I've read part of the Bible. It seems like Jesus was really a great teacher. See, we believe the same thing. They will even admit that it, yeah, Jesus was probably a, a, a really great spiritual leader. I believe that Jesus was a great spiritual leader. How about you? They're going to admit to that, and then they're going to say, see, we believe the same things. But most of these same people deny the fullness of the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is the Godhead in whom is made up by the Father, his Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So no, no. We don't believe the same things. This not only includes mainstream America, but it also includes the Mormon religion, the Jewish faith, the Muslim religion, Jehovah Witnesses, just to name a few, but there's a whole lot of others. comes down to the point, hey, was, was Jesus fully God? Is Jesus fully God? There are a few fundamental things we must take a hard line on, and this is the number one thing that we have to take a hard line on. Because if we don't stand strong here, then Jesus as the Messiah is questioned. Jesus as the Word is questioned, and therefore the Bible can be questioned. Jesus as the sinless Savior is questioned. Jesus as the only mediator between sinful man and sinless God is questioned. Jesus as the only way to heaven is questioned. And ironically, so is everything mainstream America believes Jesus to be. See, if Jesus is not the fullness of deity, he's not a significant historical figure. He's just not. He is not a great teacher. And he is absolutely not a great spiritual leader simply because if he is not the Son of God, he's a liar and he's a con man. See, it can't go both ways. Either Jesus is the full deity or he is nothing. We are not the same just because you will admit to certain points. It's all about the deity, isn't it? It's imperative we stand on our belief that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God in whom the fullness of deity, the Godhead, dwells. But here's the thing, that's not all. Because now we come to the humanity, Colossians 2, 9b, in bodily form. Three words, it's not that big, right? In bodily form. Completely expressing the divine essence of God. See, the deity of Jesus Christ is affirmed in John 1.1, 1, 1, right? We all know this. In the beginning, before all time, was the Word Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God Himself. That attests to the deity 
of Jesus Christ. The humanity, on the other hand, of Jesus Christ is affirmed in John 1.14. And the word Christ became flesh and lived among us. And we actually saw his glory. Glory as belongs to the one and only begotten Son of the Father, the Son who is truly unique, the only one of his kind who is full of grace and truth, absolutely free of deception. Jesus was always, right? We can make that statement. Where did Jesus come from? Jesus was always. In regards to infinite time, before and after, Jesus is always existing as God. But there came a time, a point in history, and, and Jesus became flesh, the physical incarnation, and he lived among us. Fully man, physically fully man, but also fully God. See, make no mistake, there is some serious theology going on here in this portion of the letter to the Colossian church. Serious theology, that to which we cannot deny. While Jesus was here, there was no sin in him. He was full of grace, and he was the most authentic example of truth that the world has ever seen, absolutely free from deception, right? Jesus would have been a horrible used car salesman. He would have been a horrible telemarketer. He wouldn't have been a salesman, right? Because salesmen, they like the kind of, he's a little deception here and everything. And, and false teachers, their entire idea, their entire basis, their entire philosophy is, is based on deception. See, Jesus stands in stark contrast to those who Paul is warning against, the ones who take you captive through philosophy and empty deception. So the humanity of Jesus is just as important as the divine aspect of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus had to be fully human and fully sinless to provide the perfect sin sacrifice. So if somebody finally gets to the point and says, okay, so Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, see, we believe the same thing. Well, did Jesus come in physical form? And when he did, was he still fully God and fully man? No, I can't. I can't acknowledge that. I can't agree with that. See, we don't believe in the same thing. See, as Christians, as true believers, as born-again Christians, we don't give anything because we have this, the Word of God that attests to all things. Amen? And now that brings us to the completeness or the complete adequacy of Christ. So let's, let's look at that. Number four, the completeness. This is verse 10. And in him you have been made complete, achieving spiritual stature through Christ. And he is the head over all rule and authority of every angelic and earthly power. This is really the pinnacle of Paul's statement here for us for each one of us. Because Jesus is fully God and fully man, those who put their trust in him and believe are brought into union with Jesus. See, it's more to just say that, hey, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I'm, a, I'm, I'm this or I'm that. No, we need to be in full union with Jesus Christ. And that's not something that, that I can make you do. That's not something your spouse can make you do. That's a decision you have to come to on your own. I'm, I'm worried that there are so many people that are sitting in church this morning and they have this false idea that, that just because they're in church, they're going to go to heaven, but they don't know Jesus in a personal relationship with Him. They haven't been brought into union with Him. Does that make sense? That's why we call ourselves born-again believers, because we've been born again by the Spirit of God. It's no longer us but Christ who lives in us. We have been crucified, yet we have been raised with his resurrection. There's the, the atonement for sin, but there's also life. That's a lifestyle that we adopt because we are rooted and we are walking with 
Christ. We are made full and complete. That completion has come. And with, with that, um, it's something that, that, that incomplete man and incomplete theologies and philosophies, they can never help us here. It's only by way of Jesus. Look at, look at Philippians 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God in every remembrance of you, always offering every prayer of mine with joy and with specific requests for all of you, thanking God for your participation and partnership, both your comforting fellowship and gracious contributions in advancing the good news, the gospel, right, regarding salvation. From the first day you heard it until now, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. Jesus is on the move. He was on the move then. He is on the move now. There is completion coming. We are in the process of being complete in him. Again, when he comes back to get us or we step into glory, that completion comes. But every day that we decide to have union with him, to have relationship with him, is another step in the completion process. To be complete in Christ means that every spiritual need we have has been fully met with Him. So much was accomplished on the cross. So much was accomplished in the resurrection. We need to be living in that so much. And who's Whose responsibility is that? God did everything He needed to. Jesus did everything He needed to. And now, now Paul is saying, see to it. See to it that nobody takes you captive, that nobody dissuades you. See to it that you follow Jesus so that you may be complete in Him. Therefore, there is no need for the faithful believer in the Colossian church to turn to any philosophy that the false teachers were propagating. See, Paul knows. Paul knows. If he can get this fundamental doctrine across to the faithful believers in the Colossian church, they will see that there is no need to be listening to these false teachers and their false philosophies and their, their feel-good stuff like that. And I think each one of us, each one of us in here, we can read this and we can understand this. And we can get behind this. And we can say things like those faithful believers in the Colossian church. They just need to look to Jesus and get rid of all those false teachings and those false philosophies, right? We can get behind that, right? We can do that. But be careful. Be careful right here about what you yourself is allowing into your life. Anything that questions the deity, the humanity, or the completeness of Christ is to be avoided at all costs. And sometimes we look at this and we think that all these people are trying to subtract from the Bible. Oh, they're trying to take this out of the Bible. They're trying to take this away from the Bible. But on the other side of things, we've got to be careful because there's a lot of people who are trying to add into the Bible things like prosperity gospel and hyper grace and all this different stuff. And, and they're trying to add it in there. We've got to be guarded on both sides. It's the deity, the humanity, the completeness. It's being in the Word. It's filtering everything through the Bible. Do you have a responsibility for your own faith? You absolutely do. Probably, probably not the message that you want to hear, right? But I'm not going to lie to you. I'm also going to tell you the truth. There's a whole bunch of other churches you could be attending to this morning which is not going to challenge you in your faith. But I'm not going to do that. I love you guys enough. I care about you guys enough to challenge you in your faith. So be careful about what you are allowing in to your life. To people, this stuff, this stuff is all over the place. And much of it is hiding under the ambiguous umbrella 
of Christianity. It's always been that way, and it always will be that way until the end of the church age and, and Jesus comes back fully in His glory. So please be careful who and what you allow into your life. Paul is basically saying here to the Colossian believers, stick with Jesus because He is more than sufficient. He is supreme. And if He's saying it to the Colossian believers, He's saying it to each one of us. Stick with Jesus because Jesus is more than sufficient. Jesus is supreme. Look at John 15, 11. I have told you these things so that my joy and my delight may be in you that, and that your joy may be made full and complete and overflowing. John 16, 24, Until now you have not asked the Father for anything in my name, but now ask and keep on asking, and you will receive so that your joy may be full and complete. Charlie, you didn't know when we were praying this morning, and you, you quoted this, this verse. You didn't know it was in the message, did you? That's some of the completion that he brings into each one of our lives. See, as followers of Christ, we are to be noticeably different. We are to walk in the joy of the Lord. Walking in the joy of the Lord, what does that even mean? Here's what it doesn't mean. Walking in the joy of the Lord doesn't mean we are, we are simply happy all the time. That we just laugh and smile, oblivious to what and who is around us. That's not walking in the joy of the Lord. That's just being naive. See, the joy of the Lord has everything to do with us having a reality and a confidence of who Christ is and who Christ is in us. And that leads to the opportunities and how we respond to the opportunities that He places in us. See, we are complete in the joy when we are with Christ, when we are walking in Him, and when we are rooted in Him. That brings stability in a chaotic world. It brings hope in a hopeless world. And it brings the light to a world that lives in darkness. And that, let's, not, not, let's not overlook how, how verse 10 ends. He is the head over all rule and authority of every angelic and earthly power. That is a very bold statement. That is an incredibly bold statement. Jesus is not only supreme and all-sufficient in the lives of those who faithfully believe and follow Him, Jesus is the Lord of all creation. He is supreme over all creation. What will the rocks do? Cry out. Animals will bow down. I mean, it's all there. He is the Lord over all things. We're not going to get weird about that or anything, but we have an understanding that we look and we, we try to separate things. Oh, the church is over here and we're safe because we believe this. But the rest of the world is over here and they're under their own thing. They're under the delusion of the enemy. But that doesn't mean Christ isn't supreme in all things, right? It's all part of His plan. It's all part of His wisdom. I don't understand it. I'm not God. I don't pretend to be. But there's a lot going on here. Worship team, if you guys want to want to come up. Jesus is the Lord of all creation and thus he and only he is head over all. He has all authority over all and that includes the angelic realm which includes both angels and demons including Satan himself. But He's also the head. He is supreme over all earthly powers. And we need to understand that. We may not like it, but we need to understand that God's plan is unfolding. That doesn't mean we're not active in our faith. That doesn't mean we're not witnessing and testifying and, and standing up for good and, and, and standing against evil. We need to be doing all of those things. We are to be a steward of everything that He gives us. We are to be active, actively following Him with the understanding that He is supreme over all things. Christ is supreme and we are invited and we are called to rest in 
and be complete in Him. Go ahead and, and pull those lights all the way down. I just have to say, how truly amazing is it that the God over all creation, I mean, He created everything. Nothing goes on without His knowledge. Nothing goes on without His okay. All of those things are happening right now around us. And yet, He calls us into relationship with Him on a personal basis. God, don't you have enough going on on your own? Keeping the world spinning? Keeping gravity intact? Making it rain? All of those things. God, aren't you totally busy? And, and He looks down and He said, I'm supreme. I can handle it. I just love you and I want to have a relationship with you. I say that simply because some of us in here have had a relationship with Jesus and it's gotten cold. Some of us have never truly had an a authentic and genuine relationship with Jesus. And some of us in here are, man, we're rocking and rolling with Jesus. It doesn't, doesn't matter where you are to a point because Jesus always has more for you. He is supreme. He wants, he wants that relationship deeper. So this morning, if you're feeling like you've been apart from Jesus, man, you're just not as close. You're not praying as much. You're not in your word as much. Maybe, maybe that fire just isn't as hot. Maybe that fire is almost completely gone out. Maybe you're sitting in here saying, well, gosh, Pastor, I, after you're talking about all this, do, do I even have a true relationship with Jesus? Well, why don't you make sure this morning? Really easy. Maybe if you're just there, man, you're in it. You're fighting spiritually. You're loving Jesus. You're looking for opportunities. Man, it's time to fill your tank this morning. Smaller numbers this morning. It means more room at the altar. Let's, let's just come to the altar and get with God. If you need prayer, we've got people to pray for you. If you're feeling empty, get full. If, if, if you're suffering, if you need a healing, a spiritual healing, a physical healing, a mental healing, a financial healing, it doesn't matter what it is. If you need a healing, come to the altar. We're going to pray with you. We got oil. We got plenty of oil to anoint. Let's just take this time and bask in the glory of God. It's not coming to the altar because you're in trouble. This isn't the principal's office. I've known that walk. Man, I knew that. I knew exactly where the principal's office was. Man, him and I were on a first-name basis. That's not this. It's not your boss calling you in because you screwed up. It's Jesus putting on your... Or it's the Holy Spirit putting on your heart that Jesus, He wants more. He wants more with you. He wants more of a relationship with you. So I'm going to pray. We're going to do something. And we're going to have these altars open. And I want you to just join me at the altar. Once again, I'm inviting you to join me at the altar. Why do I do that all the time? Because I know it's important. I know it's important. The, the walk to the altar is what's most important. Getting out of your comfort zone. It's laying your pride down and picking humility up. You're saying, Jesus, if you want me at the altar, I'll go to the altar. Jesus has got something for you. Remember, we pray. We don't want to leave here the same way as we walked in. We want to leave here closer to Jesus. So everybody stand up. Pray with me. As we enter back into worship, join me at the altar. Father, Lord, your text, your Bible, your, your scripture are so amazingly complete. They're beyond complete. They're supernatural. And Lord, that's what we, living in the natural world, we need a supernatural touch from the Holy Spirit. We need it all the time. We need it this morning. So Lord God, if, if you are convicting people this morning, if you are challenging people this morning, if you are comforting people this morning, Lord God, I ask that as your body, we can gather together at this altar, bask in your glory and rejoice and be glad. Yes. at who you are. So Jesus, meet us where we're at. Holy and I know you will, but don't leave us there. Take us to where you want us to be. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to 
bridgehelena.com, and we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.